This is Colleen Lowe, with, and we have the honor of interviewing Alice Shoots people today, and we're so excited to have you on the show, Alice. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I've wanted to interview you forever, as you know, and I'm so excited that you're here. And I was wondering, would you mind sharing with our audience, like, what you do now, but, like, you're a really good photographer. You run a clothing business. And I was just wondering, like, when you were a kid growing up, did you always want to be a photographer? Like, was that your lifelong dream, or how did, how did you get involved with being a photographer? Okay, so um, it's kind of funny because I feel as I look back now, I can pick up how I've always been interested in photography. Mm -hmm. But my dream all growing up, even until I came to college, was to be a nurse in the NICU because oh, really? I love babies. My absolute favorite thing is holding babies. And so my whole life I have dreamt of working in the NICU and being a nurse. And so I took classes in high school for that. I came to college. My first semester was all the prerequisite prerequisites to get into the nursing program at BYU. Um, and that was always my goal. To be a nurse. To be a nurse, yep. Mm -hmm. And so photography crossed my mind. Like I remember growing up, there was always uh, the state fair mm -hmm. in my hometown. So we would go to it and it was a pretty big deal. And they have photography contests in there. And I always remember really enjoying going to the exhibits and looking at photos and picking them apart. Mm -hmm. And so I recognized that I've always been interested in it, but it wasn't until I was in eighth grade that I was in a special class called GT. GT? GT, it stands for Gifted and Talented. Uh -huh. It's, I think most schools have the program, but they'll call it different things. Mm -hmm. It's just a class you have to test into. And so I was in this class and it's run differently than other classes. And we would spend most of the year working on a National History Day project. So I uh -huh. would create a big project about something in history that I would choose and I'd go compete with it. And then there was this awkward time at the end of my eighth grade year that we were done with that project um, and then before school got out. And so my teacher let us each choose oh, wow. one thing that we wanted to study for the rest of the year. And she was so good about personalizing the class for each of us, but also sitting with us and we would make our own basically schedule of what we would study each day to make sure we, we weren't wasting time, but we were being productive. And that... Um, time I chose to study photography and so that's when I started taking pictures um, I remember trying to study manual mode but I didn't understand it and so from that time forward I started taking pictures and um, I always wanted to be a wedding photographer but I still thought that I would just be a NICU nurse for the most part and then when I came to college and kind of started doing photography more, I just realized I really loved it. And I think the situation that I was in, in college, having friends getting married, I just kind of naturally fell into what turned into Alice Shoots People. And um, that's ultimately what I decided I wanted to do full time. <laughs> yeah. So when you got your first paid gig, how did it go from like being a, a, a hobby to being something that you can actually live on. Okay. Because um, people might be wondering about that. Totally. I feel like that is a really good question. Um, I feel that I have a very unique perspective on that whole subject mm -hmm. because right now in the photography world where it is a service-based business, people feel that they can barter with you on the price that they'll pay you for the wedding even though you have prices set. Especially where I'm located in Utah, a lot yeah. of it, a lot of the customers there are DIY people. They want to save money, um, and so it's all kind of a bartering system right now. And a lot of photographers get upset when they hear people aren't charging for photo shoots, regardless of the experience that you have in photography. But I have more of the perspective, I guess you could say that you ought to be charging people what you feel you can give them. And so 
if you are 100% confident that you can give them something that they love and something they want and they know what to expect, then you 100% should be charging what you feel you are worth. But if you can't guarantee that they'll get something back that they love, you shouldn't be charging. Um, so when I first started taking pictures, I was taking pictures of my neighbors mm -hmm. and I obviously didn't charge them. We would just go out for fun. Um, I think I got paid to do family photos a few times while I was in high school and maybe some senior photos, but it was only like $50. And I also hated it. I never wanted to charge. Those were all people who just would not let me take their photos without paying me. Mm -hmm. And so I never really set pricing. And then when I came to college, uh, I took a year off from photos, and then I took someone's engagement photos probably for $50, and then I spent, that's when I, it clicked that I really loved it, and I wanted to learn as much about it as I possibly could, and so I bought all new gear, and then I spent almost that entire summer just practicing with my friends, just going out, having fun, um, trying different things, learning manual mode, learning my editing. And then my very first wedding that I ever did, I got paid $125. And that included all of my travel costs to go from Provo to Preston, Idaho, and then to Brigham City and back to Preston. And I did their wedding day, which included some pictures at the temple and then also their reception. And I just at the time, I didn't feel like I really knew what I was doing. So yeah. I didn't feel comfortable charging. Um, but then each time I got asked to do a wedding, the price that I would say would just go up a little more, a little more, a little more until I found what I felt was my sweet spot mm -hmm. that I felt comfortable charging because I was confident enough in giving them what they wanted and what they would expect. Um, and then from there, it just kind of was this compound effect where I would keep this pricing sheet until I was overwhelmed with the amount of clients I had and I was killing myself with the amount of work. Mm -hmm. And then I just up my prices a little more and a little more. And that's just also how I've kept going. Um, I get to the point where I'm working myself to death and then I raise my prices and things even out and we do that until the same thing happens. And so... For me, I just raised my prices as I felt that I got better, that I had the better experience, and that I could guarantee satisfaction with my clients. Um, but I do feel that now the mindset of people who jump into photography is that they want to make money right away, that they deserve to be paid right away when they don't know what they're doing. They can't guarantee giving their client a product that they will love. And I feel that that's very dishonest and super unfair. So it's just finding your balance of... How can you guarantee satisfaction and that they will get back what they paid for? And I love how um, it it's really applies, to, I think, to all businesses where you take imperfect action. You knew it was something you loved, and so you just started doing it. And then as you went, um, I know someone else, you know, they bought an inexpensive camera and they just started shooting, shooting, and then as they got better and better, then they got more, better and better equipment. And I think that... Um, I think that the, a lot of people just get stuck in the, I, I don't know what I'm doing or where to start, so they don't start. And I do think that as you, as you got better, you raised your prices, and so then that got rid of people, right? Yeah. And uh, made it so you had less people, but higher quality. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. Um, I look at, um, I also know that you post a lot on, on social media. Social media is huge especially for photography and wedding photography. Yeah. And your pictures are amazing. Like if you guys are thinking about uh, getting married and you're wondering who should take your pictures or your engagement pictures, you should look up Alice Shoots People because <laughs> they're amazing, right? <laughs> I, they are just, be they're just beautiful to look at, these pictures. And, um, oh, I, what was I going to say to you? Oh, social media. Anyway, so it, social media. Talk to me about how social media has been a tool for your business. And then we're gonna, I want you to also talk to me about how social media, because I think sometimes social media can be so good for people, but also it can really be um, something that's hard on people because they compare their lives to other people's lives that, um, I don't know, just talk to me about 
how did you implement social media? You know, how important is that for, for your business? And then have you seen any negative side effects uh, that you have to maybe be aware of when you're looking at people's images on face, uh, social Instagram and social media? Totally. That's an awesome question. This is something that I am so passionate about. Mm -hmm. You can ask Kellen. I will talk his ear off mm -hmm. so long about social media. I feel that social media gets such a bad um, rap right now. Like everyone talks about how terrible it is, how everyone just compares. I have had such a a wonderful experience with social media. I have seen so many positive things that come from it. My entire business came from Instagram. Yeah. I've met some of my best friends on Instagram. Most of my clients come from in Instagram. I have real genuine connections with people on Instagram and it's amazing. It's totally incredible if you use it the right way. Yeah. Um, how I started my Instagram um, I got an Instagram, I think, when I was a, this, the summer between my junior and senior year is, I think, when it came out. And I was one of the first people on Instagram. I didn't know what it was. I honestly thought that it was a photo editing app. Uh -huh. I had no idea that it was another social media. Um, and so I played with it probably for six months before realizing that it was social media and figuring out how to actually use it. So I started using it, just posting, and in fact, my Instagram right now that is Alice Shoots People is the Instagram I've had forever. And so you can mm -hmm. scroll back and yeah. go back to the very beginning and see all of my super embarrassing photos or the random things that I would post. Um, but I would post, and I remember when I first started on Instagram thinking that it'd be so cool to have a lot of followers on Instagram to be mm -hmm. famous, whatever. And so that was always kind of my goal with Instagram. Um, I just thought that it would be super cool, but I didn't actually think that it would get to where I am now. Yeah, you, you have a lot of followers. And so I worked really hard. I tried different things. Um, but I think the change came for me right when I started really doing photography after my freshman year of college when I was like, okay, this is actually what I want to do. I want to really focus on my photography. I want to make it known that I'm a photographer. So I had toyed around the idea of changing my Instagram handle to Alice Shoots People for about a year before I mm -hmm. actually did it. I was afraid people wouldn't understand what the handle was referring to. I was afraid that people would take it the wrong way, but I decided to make the jump. I changed my Instagram handle, and then I also told myself that I would post every single day for a year and that I wouldn't miss a day. And that did two things for me. First of all, it was great because I was posting every day. So I was getting new followers, I was growing, I was getting my name out there. But also it forced me to go out and take new pictures. Oh. And so it was forcing me to grow mm -hmm. um, in my photography skills as well as building this platform on Instagram. And that has always kind of been my goal since then, is to post at least once a day. I used to post twice a day, and it's kind of turned into this game for me, figuring out the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy. But the one rule, basically, that I gave myself years ago was if there is anyone on social media that I either feel any sort of jealousy towards or I don't really know or care about them, I don't follow them. And so throughout oh. my time on Instagram, if I'm scrolling through my feed and I'm constantly kind of obsessing over someone or if I'm following someone that I'm like, oh, I'm really jealous of their lifestyle, I wish this was me, I without question unfollow. Oh, interesting. And so right now where there's a big movement um, against Instagram influencers because they claim that well, it's kind of crazy, but I think that um, there's this huge divide where I am in Utah right now of someone who is accusing all of the influencers and bloggers um, of being responsible for the low self-esteem of a lot of people, oh. of young girls. And I 100% disagree with that. Um, granted, I do know some influencers who I feel are not themselves on Instagram. They're not authentic. Yeah, they're not authentic. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that's how they're providing for their family. They're just doing what they feel is best to provide for their family. 
And I don't feel it's in anyone's position to judge how someone chooses to do that. But I also think that we have control over ourselves. And I think that a lot of yes. um, responsibility ought to be placed on parents to how to, how to teach their children, um, not only to have self-esteem, how to root them, root their children in um, beliefs that they can hold on to, to know who they are, um, to help their self-esteem, but also teach them how to use social media. Um, there's, I just see that, granted, like, yeah, there are a lot of ways it can be negative, but if you really focus on the good things on social media and figure out who to follow, what things you want to fill your feed with, um, it's so awesome. I think it's the next frontier. I think it's, you know, how we went from the industrial age to the information age, and I feel like we're in this, the social influencing yeah. and social media age. I feel like it's a, it's a huge um, frontier, and I think sometimes that scares people. Totally, Because uh, it's unknown to them, and it wasn't familiar when we were young. Like when I was young, uh, there's a big age difference between Alice and I. <laughs> and um, it is, um, it's unknown to us, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking... Um, and we were talking about how it's our responsibility to, to take ownership of our lives, right? And, our, yeah. and I, I was just thinking about that. And when you notice you're not feeling good, you, you don't follow those people. Yep. And that's a great skill set. And one of the things I notice on your social media, on your stories, because I know most of your stuff on your pictures is wedding related, because mm -hmm. that's your business. But I notice that on a lot of your stories, you talk about mental health issues. Tell me why you um, are posting about that and why that's important to you. Because for me personally, I think that um, mental health is something we sweep under the rug. I totally agree. <laughs> and I think it's really important. And um, um, I'll share later about why I think mental health is important. Because I used to be someone, it's hard probably for you to imagine, but I used to be someone who cried all the time and was really unhappy. And now I'm, all, mo I'd say 99% of the time, pretty happy. But, and I, I made a big shift, right? Because I made, but what do you think about mental health and why are you sharing these stories on your Instagram? Yeah, so, so um, mental health is another thing that I'm super passionate about. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because my first semester of college, um, I was really struggling in my classes. I couldn't figure out why. It just felt that something was off. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting in my classes feeling really nervous all the time. I wasn't um, excited to go to class. And I went into the counseling center because during our freshman orientation, they walked us by and said, this is a free resource. We just Recommend everyone comes and checks it out, even if you don't feel like you're struggling with something. It's just nice to know someone's there to help you. And so I set up an appointment, and I went. And during that appointment, my counselor was asking me a lot of questions, and I realized that there were a lot of things in high school that happened to me that don't usually happen when you're in high school. Um, my family went through a lot of difficult things. I went through a lot of difficult things, and I had never worked through that. Um, I didn't realize how much it was affecting me until I was in this appointment. And in that appointment, my counselor told me that I was battling depression, anxiety, mm. and that I had pretty severe post-traumatic stress disorder from what had happened to me in high school. And so he started helping me work through these I don't know if I'd call them problems, but just something that in my head wasn't quite working right that mm -hmm. was affecting my whole life. And it really helped me understand why I was feeling the way that I was feeling. But also, I remember walking out of the counselor's office and just thinking, I'm broken. No one's going to love me ever. And feeling so alone. And I was so ashamed of it. And I wasn't sure, I didn't ever want to talk about it with anyone. I felt so alone. And I remember just that whole year of my freshman year of college feeling so lost and broken and like I was the only one struggling. The only one. The only one. And 
at the end of my, I actually think it was the beginning of my sophomore year probably. Yeah, it was the beginning of, might have been the end. It was during my sophomore year of college. I took a photography class. It was the first class I'd ever taken in photography. Uh, it was awesome. I learned manual mode. Um, but we had a project at the end of the semester that we could choose whatever we wanted. And I wanted to really push myself. And so I chose to do a series of self-portraits oh. that um, portrayed basically my acceptance of my mental illness mm -hmm. and going from the shift of feeling so confused and lost and broken to recognizing what was wrong, but also accepting that that's me. There, there isn't necessarily something wrong with me. This is just something that I deal with. And then accepting that and learning how to live with it and my new life, basically. So I spent six weeks doing different things, taking pictures of myself. I would lock myself in my room and set up a black backdrop and take these photos of myself. And I started out with locking myself in my room and pulling out my iPad and reading through all of the mean things people had said about me on Facebook when I was in high school, um, reading back over all the news articles of the things that happened to my family, watching all the news, and just trying to relive that and getting to the point where I was at my lowest and then taking pictures of it. And it was so hard. <laughs> it really put me in a dark spot, and so I decided I couldn't do that anymore. So I started doing different things with the pictures. And at the end of the six weeks, I had six images that I had taken of myself that I felt truly showed what mental illness is on the inside and how I became basically one with it and grew from it. And it was so refreshing for me to work through that with myself, kind of facing what I had avoided for so long. And then as I did this in my class and started talking with other people about my mental illness, I started realizing that I was not the only one. I was by far not the only one. That I was, everyone around me was struggling with some sort of mental illness to some extent. And obviously some are a lot worse than others. But I, I was there. I know what it's like to feel alone and to feel ashamed. And I did not want anyone to feel how I had felt. And so I have chosen to take the influence that I have on social media to let people know, hey, you're not alone. I was there too. And it's okay to talk to someone and it's okay to have mental illness because when it's not talked about and you feel alone, it just gets worse. So I feel that by normalizing the mental illness battles that we all have every day, it makes it a lot more bearable and something that's more tangible for people to understand but then it also just creates this community of support for each other to help each other through the battles we have. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to understand that no one escapes from this. That, that's my opinion. I think we all have stuff. And as I've been interviewing people and I read a lot of books, I feel like a lot of the most successful people battle with something uh, at some level, uh, on a constant basis. And I think that getting control of that, working through that, going to counselors, life coaches, psychologists, whatever it is, reading books, joining support groups, I think it helps. If someone is watching or listening to this video or this um, podcast today and, and they're in a dark spot, what would you recommend? Um, I guess maybe one of my favorite things is like if you could share an obstacle that you've overcome. Uh, that maybe you haven't shared before, or maybe you have shared it before, maybe you haven't shared it before. How did you overcome it, and what would you, what would advice would you give to the Alice that was in the dark place, or our, our listeners that are listening? What what steps can they take to um, get out of? You know, I'm not saying get out of it, but to help embrace where they, what, how they are, and to, to work through things. I feel like I could share a lot of different experiences that I've had. But I feel like probably the one that I want to share is 
I've kind of what I've already shared going to counseling. Um, but making that jump from, because I remember before going to counseling, I was having such a difficult time because I am so independent. I like doing everything on my own. I don't want to rely on anyone else. And so I remember thinking that the struggles that I was having, I didn't need help, that I could just do it on my own. And then once I went to counseling, it, the hardest part for me was admitting that I need help mm -hmm. and that I can't do it alone. And through the course of my first year of counseling, coming to accept what I have, but also accepting that it doesn't mean that I'm any less of a person. And so I would recommend that if you are in the spot where you feel alone, you don't really know what to do, you're in a super dark place, go talk to someone. Mm -hmm. Even if it isn't a counselor, someone, if you're not comfortable going to counseling or you don't feel that you have the resources to go to counseling, go talk to someone that you care about and who cares about you. Just being able to have a support system around you makes all the difference. I did a mental health project about a year ago where I asked on Instagram if anyone who struggles with mental illness would be willing to come talk to me, to get interviewed, and to do a photo story of their own, like one that I had done. Oh, yeah. And I had a few hundred people reach out to do it, and I think I ended up interviewing about 25 people. And it was so interesting for me as I sat and I listened to all of their struggles, and we all cried together. And it was such a beautiful moment of healing, I think, for all of us involved. But there were two things that set people apart when they would come in and talk to us. That was a very, there was a very fine line between the people who were super struggling, barely holding on, and the people who had a really good grip on what was happening in their life. And it came down to two things that set them apart. Number one, mm -hmm. that they had a support system, regardless of whether that was a counselor or family or friends, roommates, they just, they had a support system, someone that they could go to who knew what was going on, who cared about them, who reached out to them, but they also felt comfortable reaching out to that person as well. And the second thing is something that they had in their life that they were passionate about. So for me, oh, yeah. it was my photography that I was able to really truly dive into and love and put my time and energy in and it gave my life meaning. Mm -hmm. And for the girls who came in and were interviewed with us, there were some that loved drama, theater, art. There were other photographers who came. Someone was a model. Um, there were just different things. Or even some of them loved what they were doing in school. It was just something that they were passionate about that gave their life meaning. And so if you are in a dark spot, create a support system. Don't wait for people to reach out to you. You reach out to other people. But also find something you love and that you are passionate about that can, you can feel your time with, that you can grow in, become better at, that you can just become super passionate about because it will give your life meaning. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I think passion is the key because when we're passionate about something, then we're, we're going to pursue it. Whether, like, like you, you knew you were passionate about photography and so no one was paying you up front but you got better and better and spent more and more time at it and then I think that you get better and better and then someone is paying you right mm -hmm. um let's talk about something you just said a little while ago you said you felt like no one would love you and um I know you're a young married person and you found love talk to people about um how, how do you find love and how how do uh, marriage you know marriage and relationships work and what are your ideas and thoughts on that? Um, I feel like looking back, well, my whole life, I thought that I would graduate high school, move to college, and get married before I was 20. That I would just start, I would immediately have kids, become a mom. And so when I moved to college, and first of all, was diagnosed with my PTSD and stuff, the first thing that came to my mind was, wow, no one's going to love me. Why would anyone who found out what I was struggling with want to marry me? That seems like such, such a problem that they wouldn't want to deal with. And so I slowly had to come to the terms that maybe I was not going to get married quickly. And I remember 
kind of battling back and forth because there was, so my freshman year of college, I dated quite a bit. My sophomore year of college, I probably can count on one hand how many dates I went on. And I remember that that was so hard in, on me in a lot of ways, but in particular, my self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, why am I not getting asked out? Seems like my friends are always going on dates. What am I doing wrong? Why does no one like me? And that's something that as girls, I feel we battle Gosh, I know. all the time, regardless of what age we are. I remember feeling that way in high school and in middle school, too. Um, but that year, looking back, was so good for me because it forced me to hang out with me, mm -hmm. to get to know myself, to find what I was passionate about, to find meaning in my life, to come to know what I really liked, what I didn't like, what I enjoyed mm -hmm. doing, just kind of figuring out who I was as a person and so as the years progressed after that, it was super good for me to know me for me and know who I am. And I can see now being married to Kellen, he's so supportive of everything that I do, but also where I know myself and I knew myself before getting married and I feel that he did too. It's been great. We just compliment each other that time. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not saying that if you don't spend that time getting to know yourself before you get married that it's going to fail or your marriage is going to be any less. I think everyone has their own story. Everyone has different timing in their life. Everyone comes from different places, and somehow it all works out for us. But for me, having that time to myself, but also having the time to figure out my business before getting married or meeting Kellen and just kind of figuring out my life and my mental illness, just kind of getting my life in order before introducing a relationship and a marriage into it has been super helpful for me. And so, I don't know. It's been, but it's also been great being married because I see how it's benefited my life having that constant relationship in my life. Always someone to come home to. He's my best friend. We talk about everything. Just having that complimentary person in my life just enriches everything that I do so much more. Yeah, it gives more meaning to it, I feel like. Um, I was just thinking about, you take a lot of really cool wedding pictures, and um, I feel like one of the most important things when you get married is to have you know, your pictures, because that's one of the things that you have left, right? Yeah. And um, I was thinking about all the, if, when you think back on all the pictures you've taken, is there any favorite moments you have during the, the wedding time? Like, during a wedding, is there a favorite moment in the wedding? Oh, I feel like my answer to this question changes often. Mm -hmm. I love toasts during mm -hmm. weddings a lot because you get to know everyone's personalities and you hear all these funny stories about the bride and groom, and then you also hear just how much they love each other. It's just a very intimate moment that everyone shares together. So I love that. I love when they share their vows with each other. And I feel like that's something that straight across the board, I always love mm -hmm. when that's happening. I love when they're doing their first dance. I love when they see each other for the first time. Just all those super raw emotions and intimate experiences that I get to be a part of always stand out to me. But if I had to look back and pick one moment in particular that stands out to me in my head, I don't think it would actually be one of the weddings that I have photographed because as I've done weddings, I've come to, and my degree actually is called experience design and management. So I focus a lot on experiences. The experience as a whole, the emotions that I feel, how I'm transformed, all of these different things, I just, I focus on the experience and that's also how I work with my couples. I focus on their experience, making it the best experience for them. And so for me, it comes down to what experiences have I felt and have most touched me. And I would say that the experience that has probably touched me the most in my photography is an experience that I had in December and the beginning of January 
where I got to photograph um, a, a birth story for a family whose son was not going to live. They didn't know how much time he had or if he would live at all. So there were a lot of things up in the air. And I was in the room when he was born, and his, he wasn't breathing, and they got him breathing, and he ended up living longer than they thought he would. He lived for two days. But I got to be with the family for the first oh, I don't know, probably eight hours of this, six to eight hours of this baby's life. And I got to hold him, and I got to be with the family as they went through all of the emotions of being so grateful but also being so terrified of when he would stop breathing, the fear of the unknown. They feared opening their hearts to him and loving him because they knew that it would hurt. But seeing them say, like, no, like, we're going to choose to love him, like, this is... This is what we want, and also seeing it to the very end where they asked me to come be there for the funeral and the viewing as well. And I got, they asked me to stay in the room as they closed the casket and held him for one last time. And just being in such an intimate experience, it's the last time that they'll get to see their son on this earth. I was there the first time they saw him and the last time. And them telling me, like, your family, we want you here with us. I I don't even know if I can put it into words, um, being able to experience everything with that little family has really kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I'm so grateful for it. And they've been so gracious to me for those photographs and the videos that I got for them. And it just brings it all back to me in understanding that it's all, my job is so important in capturing these once in a lifetime experiences that these people have. And it's my job to tell that story in a way that by looking at a photo, they can relive that experience over and over because they don't, they don't ever get to do that again. Yeah, that's incredible that you were there and it's a tender moment so much going on there they were really smart to have you come I feel so blessed that I got to be there Mm -hmm. for that and that they would let me in to the most intimate parts of their life yeah and they have those pictures forever Mm -hmm. yeah I feel like a picture does it captures so much emotion so much and it brings it I, I feel as I get older I have a hard time remembering things, but if I see a picture of something, an old picture, because I'm cleaning out my house, and so I'm coming across old pictures <laughs> in random places, I see the picture, and I don't remember that time until I see the picture, right? And I'm like, oh, I remember that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Pictures are, they're so important, right? They remind totally. us. <laughs> and I think, like, for that family, um, I don't know, I feel like when you're in a life and death situation like that, um, I feel like the the... The separation between heaven and earth is very, I don't know, it's just very, um, there's a lot of fluidity that goes on between. And for those of you, um, I I believe in angels and stuff like that. And so for me, I I feel like my son was sick and I just feel like there's just a lot of fluidity in those moments. And there's just, there is a lot of emotions with those people. They're, it's it's raw. Yeah. But I also think that that goes back to something you mentioned earlier where, in these experiences, you have, it's so easy to say, well, to talk about how terrible it is or how you're sorry for yourself, Mm -hmm. but instead choosing to look for the positive and all of the good around you. And it takes that experience that could be so easily terrible and turns it into such a wonderful transformative experience for you. And it all came down to a decision that you made. Yeah, we choose. I I believe we choose joy. Um, I didn't get that. That, It took me a long time to figure that out. I used to, um, I thought my life was going to turn out a certain way. I think we all do. We have a vision of what our life's going to turn out like. And um, and it's good to have goals and dreams and everything, but when my life didn't turn out like I thought it was supposed to, I was devastated, and I didn't have any coping mechanisms or tools to process that, and I used to cry all the time. And And I would complain to anybody who would listen to me. Uh, complain about everything the same thing over and over again and um, it's so funny that um, we do we we can choose how we what we focus on 
and what we focus on expands. Um, I was thinking about, it's interesting too how um, our experiences shift like you, you wanted to be a nurse, right? And then it shifted to, it, it's such a fluid thing, life. And then you went to photography, right? And then I was just thinking about how we, you, when you, when you want to build wealth, because I'm really into building wealth, because uh, our son was sick. And then I realized that how quickly you can run out of money when you have a sick child. Or if you want to take care of a sick parent, or if you want to just travel, whatever the reason is you want to have um, wealth and money and financial stability. Um, I, until my son got sick, it wasn't on my radar really too much about um, how important it is to have financial wealth and passive income to live on so you have the freedom to do stuff. And I was thinking about how you're la I, I'm watching you layer in your business because you don't just do photography. You're layering other businesses w on, to on top of and in, in, or adjacent to, an, in, to, um, to your photography business. And I know you started a clothing line uh, talk to us about that and how does that work and why and why why are you doing that and what 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 if someone wants to layer their their multiple streams of income talk to us about that I think that's important awesome so I think it comes down to balance mm -hmm. you there's always a struggle I think when you mix something new into your life but finding that balance is so key this is something that I don't feel I'm perfect at but over time, I'm getting better at. So I started my clothing business, actually. I opened it a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. a little less than a year and a half ago. And what's it called? Now it's called Alice Loves Clothes. But oh, yeah. I started it with a friend, actually. Uh -huh. And it was under a different name. We were together for a few months. And after a few months, my business partner came to me and said she didn't want to do it with me anymore, that she wanted to split. And Kellen and I had just found out we were moving to New York. Uh -huh. And so I didn't think it would be possible for me to keep it up on my own. But it's a long story that I could spend hours on on how I did it. But we figured out a way to keep my shop running mm -hmm. while I was in New York long enough for us to go do that. But then come home and officially launch online, really push it with the marketing. And my goal with my business is not necessarily to become rich off of it or to make a ton of money. It's so that it does two things. First mm -hmm. of all, it gives women the opportunity to get the same boutique clothes that they can get anywhere else, but at a cheaper price so that they don't have to spend $100 on a new sweater that they want. They can get it for a fraction of that cost. So, so it's, it's more affordable. It's to help everyone mm -hmm. with it be more affordable. But it's also, as much as I love photography – it consumes my life. It's what I do from sun up to sundown, and some nights it's what I do every waking moment that I mm -hmm. am up. And so it does a service for me and my anxiety because it mm -hmm. forces me to mix things up. It forces me to take time away from my photography every day to focus on getting orders out. How am I, how am I going to market this? Um, try different business things. And it's been really fun for me, and I've developed a lot of awesome relationships as well through it um, with my customers and I have a rep program and I've gotten very close with some of the reps that I have and I remember there have been a lot of times I've been overwhelmed that I've thought about closing my shop because it is a lot to do on my own in addition to my photography business but I have found that balance um, where I set the alarm I get up in the morning and I immediately go spend two hours with my shop and then I work out, and then I get ready for the day, and then I spend the rest of my day working on my photography. And during the winter, it's been really easy because I work on my photography until the sun goes down, and then I'm done for the night. I don't touch anything until the next morning I get up and I do the same routine. And then during the summer, it'll probably shift a little bit because the sun's up so long. But I set boundaries for myself. I get up every morning. I write down all of the things I need to do for the day. And as I do them, I mark them off. And something that I've learned with my anxiety is if I don't get everything done on my list, I can't beat myself up over it. I just have to accept, okay, that's okay. I'm going to do it tomorrow. And it's been so helpful for me. It's also such a big accomplishment when I do get something marked off my list. I feel so good. 
And so it's just kind of figuring out what exactly you need to get done, the order that you need to get it done in, and then also setting boundaries for yourself. How long am I going to work on this? This is what I'm going to get done today. Um, make sure that I get everything done that I need to. And at the end of the day, kind of congratulate myself on what I did get done That's and so celebrate what I did get done and then go to bed and wake up the next morning and do the same thing. So you, you, you purposely spend time blo time, blocks of time doing yep. certain activities for certain parts of your business and, and your personal life, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And you travel and have yeah. fun. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're always going somewhere and doing something fun, right? Yeah, we're always trying new things. We love going places. And a lot of the time it is for work. I actually don't know if I can remember. Well, actually, we've, I think we've done one trip that was That's for us, fun. but it was kind of a work thing too. But most of the time we travel for work. We're always traveling mm -hmm. for the different things I'm doing. And we make sure to have fun when we go. to Kind of make it a little less work and more of um, an experience for us, so. Yeah, I think, that w so I think that what you said about making sure that the experience is great for the client and that they have the ultimate experience, um, why, why do you think that's so important? I think that's important. Um, I, I, I think it's really important, but why do you think that's so important? I think it's so important because the experience is everything. You have, well, I think that, like you've mentioned, when you look at a photograph, it triggers so many memories mm -hmm. associated with that photo. And if you have a terrible experience, you are not going to enjoy looking at your photos. Mm -hmm. And you want your wedding day to be the best day of your life. So whatever I can do for that to happen is awesome. I've done my job. Um, and focusing on that experience, that good experience, it makes them really enjoy looking at their photos. They get to relive that awesome experience over and over and over, and they get to do that for the rest of their lives. But also the photos, I try to do it in a way that even if someone doesn't attend the wedding, they can still kind of experience that same feeling that everyone else did while they were there. But I am a firm believer that if you don't have a good experience with your wedding day, you're going to hate your wedding photos. It doesn't matter who takes them, what they look like, you're going to hate them. Mm -hmm. So it's key having a good experience so that when they get their photos back, it reminds them of their great experience. Yeah, I was thinking um, when I we were talking about like how you look at life and how you can look at one way or another. This is one thing I want to say. One, do you have any other advice for people that are listening who want to either start a clothing business online or a photography business? Is there anything else that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Yeah, I feel like there are a lot of times you're going to want to give up. Oh. In my photography business, even sometimes now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, I just want to give up. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> this is so hard. I'm not where I want to be. And it's so easy to just tear yourself down. Just know that's going to happen. It will always happen. But to push through it. To use that as motivation to get better, to learn the things you want to learn. Set goals for yourself. Find ways to attain those goals, but don't give up. Nothing is going to come easily. There are going to be times that you are going to fail and you will want to give up. But don't give up. That's what sets the people who are successful apart from the people who are not the ones who take their failures and turn it into ways they can grow, learn from it, and continue forward versus those that are like, oh, this is hard. I don't want to work hard, and they give up. So don't give up. It's hard. Yeah, it's right? Hard. Just keep moving. Yep. Yeah, and we all have hard days. Oh, yeah. And anything worth attaining, I think, is hard, you know? I totally agree. Yeah, and when you're trying new stuff and doing it, and when you're growing your business to the next level and the next level, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, you don't know. Totally. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about miracles. So my podcast is called, uh, miracles are my normal. And I was wondering if you had thought about if you've witnessed a miracle in your life. I've witnessed so many miracles in my life. I can talk about all the different aspects of my life and come up with miracles. Um, even in my business, there have been miracles where... <laughs> I've shown up on time when I was running late 
little things like that. Or I've been uh, in my client's car one time and they hit a deer and <gasps> nothing happened to the car. We were all fine. The car was fine. Just like all these random little miracles. But I feel like a miracle that I've experienced in my life that was a very pivotal moment in my life actually happened to me when I was in high school. I had, so it's a super long story, but I have had a lot of surgeries on my leg. Mm -hmm. I was in a basketball, I was playing basketball when I was a freshman in high school and some girls intentionally fouled me and my leg got crushed into the floor. It dislocated my kneecap, it tore some ligaments in my knee. And when I went in finally six months later to find out what had happened, they told me I needed surgery. I went in for surgery and they t found out in my surgery that my leg had actually grown wrong. So it was a lot bigger of a problem than we oh. initially thought it was going to be. And when I woke up from surgery, my recovery time went from what was supposed to be two or three weeks to who knows how long. Wow. And I have a circulation disorder called Raynaud's phenomenon. And everyone has it different, but in my body, my veins are just too small, so I don't get enough circulation. So it affects my body in a lot of different ways. But one of them is my healing process is a lot slower than it huh. normally is for other people because I just don't have that blood supply to heal. And for whatever reason, my scar tissue after my surgery, my first one built up a lot. And I ended up having to have an emergency procedure where they oh, took wow. me in the operating room, put me to sleep, and then they push on my leg until <clears throat> my scar tissue breaks so that I can have mobility. And so they had done that one time, that was at 8 p.m. I think at night, and the next morning I woke up and went back into physical therapy by 8 a.m. And in that 12 hour time period, it had all grown back and my leg couldn't move again. And so my doctor had given me a timeline. I think I had two weeks to get 90% mobility and I was trying so hard and I was, going to physical therapy all the time. I was in so much pain and I couldn't do it. My leg was not moving, my knee wouldn't move. And it came to a few days before the appointment that if I went to and I didn't have that mobility, I would have to go have that procedure again and I did not want it, it was very painful. And I still didn't have any range of motion and I was super frustrated and so I just gave up. I remember just feeling so overwhelmed and like all my pain was for no reason at all. I was just going to have to have the procedure. And so I just stopped. I completely gave up, accepted that I would have to have the procedure again. And I ended up getting a priesthood blessing from my brother that day. And he had no idea. No one knew that I had stopped or had given up. And in the blessing, it told me that I needed to continue doing my part. And then the Lord would do his part as well, mm -hmm. but he couldn't do his part if I didn't do mine. And so I took that as him saying, okay, I know you've stopped. I know you've quit. You need to keep going, keep trying. And so I started my exercises back up and I still wasn't getting anywhere at all. And I went into physical therapy right before my appointment and I still didn't have the mobility. So I packed my bag as if we were going to go to the hospital, went to my appointment, and my doctor checked me, and sure enough, I didn't have the mobility. So he brought in, I think he was bringing in the paperwork for us to sign to get me all ready to go over to the hospital. And as he left the room, he turned around and he said, you know, I just, I want to check one more time. I just feel like we should check. And I laid back on the table, and I had my full range of motion. And I didn't have to have the other procedure. And I remember that being such a pivotal moment in my life for a lot of different reasons. But for the first time in my life, I felt that I was truly known and understood by my Heavenly Father and my Savior. And knowing, just being so overwhelmed with the love that they have for me, no matter what, has played a huge role in my life. And in my, my confidence, my self-esteem, just knowing that there's always someone there who is looking out for me and loves me unconditionally. And I would not be where I am today without that experience that I had. It shifted everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love how you shared different things like 
from the small. I think miracles are every day if we look oh, for them. Oh, yeah, totally. Everything from being on time <laughs> to um, the deer to the big, huge things, right, in our life. They're, they're everywhere if we look for them. We woke up today. I think that's a miracle. Yeah. Alice, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for letting me. <laughs> You're so cute. I just adore you, and I'm so glad that you are our guest, and that I know that you spread a lot of light, and um, I follow you, uh, not just personally, but like on Instagram, and I just think um, that if you guys want to follow someone who's real and authentic and spreads love and joy and is just a really good person, I would recommend you follow Alice Shoots People. Thank you. And buy your clothes from her, too. Because <laughs> I'm going to. That's one of my goals. Buy more clothes. Anyway, thanks for joining us. It's uh, Colleen Lowe.